everyone to All Souls into Faith gathering. This is the third and final um, session of this wonderful conversation series, Lighten Up, and it's going to be about light and spirit, how it moves through art, how it moves through sound, and how it moves through motion and Tai Chi, and we're very excited to welcome these wonderful people. And of course, Fran Stoddard always does a beautiful job, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So, yeah, today we'll, we'll talk with three artists who are at a very high level of, of consciousness and uh, bring their practice and art to us tonight. When the committee uh, that forms, that creates these conversations, came together and came up with this theme of lighten up, we realized how much it could mean. Last week it was about renewable energy. Lighten up could be about humor. It could be making our lives a little less serious. Uh, lighten up could mean so, so many things, letting go of baggage. And today it's really about spiritual light, and I want to thank Lisa Desmond, who also found this fabulous trio of folks. So we're exploring how some have brought light into their lives and into the lives of others through their art and practice. We have um, Melinda Kinsey, she's a sound healer. Ernie Pomerlo, many might know as a local businessman, um, is also, he says he's a student of Tai Chi, but much deeper than that. Um, and Ray Harrell is an artist of many mediums, a wonderful trio of folks. Today's conversation is also going to be experiential. We'll have a little bit of movement and a little bit of wonderful sound. We're going to begin with sound so you get a sense of what uh, Melinda does in her sound work. Sound has certainly been used for, millennial, for millennia. We'll hear from Melinda in a, in a moment more about it. And more recently, you, these benefits have been confirmed by science, which is pretty cool. So before we just take a few minutes to just get a little taste and tease of what Melinda does, she's going to say a few words about what she's going to do. Oh, I just thought I would invite you to um, really arrive. So really be fully located in your chair where you are. Just for kicks. Not because you have to, but because it's funner that way. And um, on the drive here, Fran, I was thinking about light and I thought of all these things. Um, because as a sound healer, there's new science every day about um, what sound really is and how sound affects matter and how light is sound and sound is light. And um, I thought, isn't that funny that I would like to explain something more to you that we all already really know all we need to know. <laughs> because when the sun shines <clears throat> on us, how could I explain to you what that felt like? It would be silly. We all already know. And we know uh, about light. So I thought I would just play these bowls and let you um, experiment with seeing how the sound feels to you. And um, if you have not ever before known yourself as a being of light, maybe you would try just for a minute.
and let this be a blast of light from the inside out. Melinda McKenzie is a Vermont native. Actually, she's a daughter of musicians. Some of you may um, know or have known Alice um, Damon and Bill Kinsey, uh, which is pretty cool. She worked as a recording artist in New York City for two decades. And she was compelled to return to Vermont to pursue a new calling and trained for three years to become a sound healer. Mm -hmm. So what drove you from this two-decade career as a musician in New York to return here and pursue something quite different? Well. And thank you, by the way. That was oh, really beautiful. My pleasure, 100%. Thank you for your beautiful generous availability for that kind of party. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I, I was, you know, deeply immersed in um, the music industry and having grown up with parents that were music people and wildly overly creative um, stuff all the time, around me all the time, I had babies mm. in that Manhattan. And I started, I had been there for 20 years, and I started wanting um, dirt roads and trees. <laughs> so that was primarily uh, one of the biggest reasons I came home. Um, but I also was having um, a deeper spiritual um, experience while I was singing in clubs and with big costumes and really loud music. Um, and I thought, ooh, something else is going on now with me. <laughs> and I started uh, missing the earth. And I thought, oh, I think I have to go home. And um, I think I, I'm supposed to find a shaman or some earth wisdom, some earth medicine person. And it wasn't about sound at first. You really wanted to leave that behind. Mm -hmm. I was so how, how did you come? Because I think we all have callings, but we think we know what they are, and then sometimes there's a shift. So right. tell us just a, a little bit about that, of finding this, this calling. Yes. Well, um, it was one of those moments, because that's what we're talking about today, isn't it? It was one of those moments where I, um, where what I had been doing and the, the dreams that I had and all of the work I'd done to travel so far down my dream road, I was really fulfilling a lot of stuff, a lot of my, my fantasies. But uh, one day, I, could, I didn't care anymore. And I, I didn't care how much money I made, and I didn't care if I became famous, and I, I couldn't find anything inside of it to care about, mm. um, except for the world that I got to be in when I was creating. That was the only thing I liked. Um, and then when I decided to move back to Vermont, I knew that I was um, going to experience the death of my, mm. who I had been, of myself. Um, I didn't know how intense it was going to be, but it was a lot more intense than I had planned on. <laughs> um, and I came here and um, did not know what I was going to do, but I Googled one night, best shaman in Vermont. <laughs> 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 For real. And I got, uh, two sound healers, and one of them lived in Vermont, and one of them lived on the West Coast, and I listened to their sound, and I thought, whoa, that's so weird. 
that's just so weird. It made me feel something, but I didn't understand what it was. And then I found my teacher in Vermont and I said, I, I want to be, you know, Luke Skywalker and you can be Yoda and I'll, you know, do your dishes and you can teach me how to be a shaman. And he said, no, I don't think so. And he said, but I have a school that's a school of sound healing and it's a training, the most extensive training for a sound healer in the world, short of going to live with a a tribe or an elder of, a, of a, some wisdom culture. And um, I said, well, I don't want to do sound. I don't want to ever sing again. I'm all done. I can't, I, don't, I'm, I know all about it. And I don't want anything to do with it. And he laughed and he said, okay. Well, I think that everything you're looking for is in that school. And I was like, well, it's definitely not. <laughs> and then one thing led to another and I ended up there I got a grant and all kinds of things worked out I had tiny children and there was no reason I should have thought that I could do it I had no money and tiny kids and um, I ended up there and on the first day I sat there and just wept at how I, I could see how everything that I had ever done was all to get me to that spot on that day. We have a lot to move through, so yeah, I'd like to do then, it. that was, it's a beautiful story though, and yeah. about listening. So just tell us briefly, what is sound healing? And mm. what does it actually do to us physiologically? What's, mm. what's happening? Mm. I know we can't encompass three years of of teaching here, but how, mm. how do you let us lay people know what this is kind of all about? Mm. Well, sound, um, everything is sound. There's a saying, Nada Brahma, all is sound. Um, and people have known that for a long, long time, and we forgot. So we're just remembering. It's not a new concept but it's new to us. Um, uh, it's just vibrating particles, just like your body and your chair and everything that we think um, is solid is just vibrating particles and sound and light are just particles vibrating at a higher frequency and um, the reason you can feel it, and the reason that it's a, it's, it can be used as a healing um, tool is because when it's coupled with intention, as you know in the world of quantum physics, all you have to do is think about something and it changes. So when you couple uh, pure intention with sound in the intention of being of service, it's like a laser. And that may sound just completely crazy to you, but it's scientifically proven and really true. So since you're mostly water, your body, and after being mostly water, you're actually mostly space. So uh, when you're bathed in pure tones that are infused with love, you can become more whole, you can release uh, denser vibrations that you have been holding on to, that have been stuck in your body. Uh, you can become more aligned and you can walk away um, feeling really altered. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's your little taste <laughs> <laughs> of sound healing. Uh -huh. Now we move, and there will be a Q&A, believe me. Yeah. We are moving to movement, and movement meditation, and much more. So Ernie Pomerleau is president of Pomerleau Real Estate. Probably many of you are, are familiar with him, and, and certainly that business. He's also the honorary consul of France for Vermont, which is very cool. 
and trustee and director on numerous state and regional uh, boards and an amazing sailor who competes all over the world, really, but certainly in the Caribbean and some other parts that I know. And unbeknownst to me, and, and maybe many, um, before uh, recently, he is also the president of the Tai Chi Institute and he teaches Tai Chi internationally. So he sneaks away from Vermont and teaches for weeks at a time all over Europe uh, because he's at a very, very high level um, of his practice. So we're gonna talk about Tai Chi for a few minutes and maybe even have a, a little a demonstration well, of what that's all about. I'm a little... Well, first, I, I, thanks for having me here. I, I find this fascinating because I, I know every one of you bring your own passion to this. You just heard passion, right? I mean, uh, and so it's really fun to see how people integrate that passion, whatever it is, and everybody has one or two or ten, um, and how you bring that together. What I'll try to explain, and Fran will guide me because I'm not giving a speech, um, is look at this three ways. Um, tai Chi is a beautiful exercise. It's meditation, it's moving, it's about letting go. Um, everything you probably hear about is letting go. There's a beautiful Buddhist axiom that goes something like, there's only three things at the end of your life that you really need to have accomplished. You need to have to learn to fully live. You need to have learned to deeply love. And third, but the most difficult, is you, have, you needed to learn to let go. So if you think about one axiom, whether it's an Eastern meditation, a Western psychotherapy, a yoga, I would tell you that at the heart of it, or if you have a relationship issue, it's about letting go. So I studied hard style for a long time. So what I want to talk a little bit about is this beautiful moving meditation, but what it does internally. And we age from our feet. Kind of sounds strange. But if you lose connection with your root, you tend to lose your connection to your center, your core, your up. I was talking to Fran about the way she hits from as I know nothing about taiko drumming. But something that has lasted for hundreds of years doesn't use muscles. It uses movement. What you just heard is movement, sound, feeling. So, what, so we have this movement that I've really come to love. I was a black belt in karate, right? Big, tough, strong, smash, bang. And all of a sudden, I was like, this hurts, and I'm getting tired of it. So I studied for years a seeker. Um, trying to find something that embellished more of who I was and what I wanted to do. I loved the martial arts, and I wanted to find it. And I won't go through the whole story, but I, I came across um, a teacher that I had known since I was 18 years old that had converted to Tai Chi. And then we got to move on to China and found the greatest of all greats. But So in this little thing I'm going to show you is a beautiful, quiet, letting go, using your core movement, learning root. If you did nothing but that, it would be beautiful. In that, softness is the quintessential most powerful martial art I ever studied. And I'll show you some of it. But now what I want to do is the third part of this is what a beautiful metaphor for me. We all find reasons to do certain things. I'm in business. Um, but everybody has stresses, whether it's family stresses, you name it. We, ha we live in stress, and one of the things I think you just experienced is a nice way to release it. Um, so if the Western ideology is muscles and strength and power, that's what you want to exhibit, right? I'm going to show you something that is faster, quieter, better, and stronger not using muscles. A martial art that can't be beaten. So I'm not going to do much of it, but do you, okay. yeah. So <clears throat> a couple of things, let me just show you. So if, if you were to try to hit me, I'd block you and I'd smash you and I'd do all that stuff, right? So, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to have you move my hand, just push it hard. Now watch what happens. Fast. She's unbalanced, I've got her, and if she wants to go this way. Now, 
if she came at me this way, I'm just moving my body. And watch, this is muscles, right? This is, if I wanted to move her, I would just go inside. I just did that on one foot. I want to take care of my shoulder here. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, is, it is interesting how there's this slow yeah. and then so, very fast and, and pretty scary. So watch, if, let, me show you, let me show you one of the moves you would go like this, right? This is a form, and you go like this and this. But watch what this is. Do a slow punch just at me. So watch. I come in. I make sure her foot doesn't come up. And I just push this up, and I push this down. If I do something, I do this. It's very simple. It's very quick. It's very fast. The other thing is, watch. If you go to punch, it, you've got to tighten your muscles. Watch. Boom, boom. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice she blocked after my hand came back? <laughs> so what I wanted to show you, it's because it's really about a metaphor and why we do these things. I've never beaten anybody up. That's not my intention. I don't have to because I'm not worried about people beating me up. So, but what I found could. is what? Because you could. Because I could. Yes. <laughs> so, but let me show you. I know how far yeah, this goes out. Yeah, yeah I guess plenty. we're good. We, you've, got, you've got a nice long uh, leash. You're going to rein me in? No. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me when I'm saying something wrong. No, do you want me to move the bolts? So what I want to show you is that if you really kind of get into your root, it's all about letting go, letting go. Watch my shoulders. They're not going to move. And my hand, watch this. I want to show you something. One more thing. Sure. So <clears throat> I'm going to push. With pressure, you're going to feel pressure, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm on one foot. And then just don't tell me, just drop that hand. You felt pressure, but nothing happened. What I felt you doing was this. See? Uh, just by dropping. No, I could, but see, when I, I, yeah. see how you know what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. What do you know I'm doing? You're not doing I'm a doing thing. that thing. But if she moves, she tells me, because watch, you can feel this. You can't feel this. <laughs> so I wait. All I do is I wait. Now, let me put this into a negotiation protocol. <laughs> if somebody comes at you and goes, F you, and you go, F you back, what happens? Boom. Somebody says, F you, and you go, you sound like you're having a really bad day. What happened? They will generally tell you. But watch the different styles. So I can fight and do my old Tai Chi. I mean, my old karate, I forget. My old karate where my shoulder would go into it and I'd be punching. But if you watch, watch this line. It won't move. My shoulders are still, because my shoulders aren't doing anything, and this doesn't get hard. What I showed you as I was pushing, and if you touch this, it would be loose. So where do you get your power? Get your power from your root, and from your back. But think about how wonderful that is for your organs. You're not here. You're soft. You're moving. And you do it. So everything, this is a block. This is another block. Now watch. If I did it fast, you wouldn't know if I had balance. And I go, from one, I go one side to one side. 100% on one side. 100, why? Because it's faster. If you double weighted, i got to come up off of one to move. So if you learn this root system, mm -hmm. so and it just doesn't matter what you're doing. And if I never fought, this takes 20 minutes for me to do. And you blank out your mind. This is a push. This is a pull. This is a push. This is moving an arm, catching. But the idea is to be absolutely still inside. But each one is using my whole body. If, so, if this was a hand, boom. And I wouldn't wait. I would if, by the way, this is cool. So if you got into a confrontation, and this is where I'm going to get metaphorical on you, you don't attack. All I think about is for the person to move so I can find where they are 
out of balance. I just move. And I can feel, if I'm rooted, where they have lost their balance. The second they have lost their balance, they can't stand. They're going that way, I help them go that way. They're going this way, I help them go this way. Think about that in life with negotiation, with discussions that get heated up. So I live this, so if I negotiate, I'm mediating, I can't get out of this head. It's not an attack, it's waiting, it's moving, it's feeling, and trying to find how I make peace with the other person in a way that they're okay and I don't lose. Anyway, so it's a, it's a wonderful, Tai Chi, I know it's taught here, it's a beautiful, beautiful movement, but it does have inside of it an ancient history of phenomenal power, and yet it's a wonderful balance of a passion for me that is a metaphor for my life, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. More than a metaphor, clearly, a practice, a practice. for yeah. the rest of, of your life. Um, well, you answered almost all of my questions. There you go. Which was great. <laughs> and you didn't even so, give them to me. Uh, it was just perfect. <laughs> Talked about this a little bit before. But the question that I have, which was, came from an, an article about um, Bob, Bob, Bill, Boyd. Bob Boyd, is that he inherited a practice called the snake style, which yeah. is very unusual in, in China, and, and that it's open source. And I think that story is so interesting. So you had been doing karate for a while and yep. some tai chi. Tell us about that shift, because in, in a way it's similar, where well, you made a shift in how yeah, it affected I, I, you. I, that was interesting in your story, because <clears throat> I had studied karate for decades. It was you know, healthy and it was strong. And when you're 18 years old, you want to you belt and you want stuff. Um, there's no belts in Tai Chi, which I thought was one of the reasons I followed it, because it, you let go of all that stuff. But um, I studied Tai Chi for 15 years, ended up in China, and you know, how did you end up where you were? It was supposed to be, right. okay? And I haven't heard your story, but same way. You just, if you fall, there's an old saying, Joseph Campbell once wrote, and I love it. In order to be successful, in order to be happy, you have to learn to follow your bliss. Bob followed, he wanted to be the best martial artist since he was 18 years old when we first met. If you think of that every day you get up, you'll eventually get there. It'll drive you. You know, there's an old saying, um, <clears throat> you know, action, um, <clears throat> action without vision is just running in place. Vision without action is just a dream. You put vision and action together, it'll take you where you want to go. It'll change the world. So that's where he was. We go to China. Um, he, long story, I won't get into it. Master Rip. And um, I'd studied for 15 years, and he says, show me your form, Ernest. And I do my form for 20 minutes, and he goes, no good. I've been 15 <laughs> years. I'm like, come on, you got to give me a break here. Anyway, so the answer was, for reasons that he and Bob got together at a very, very wonderful level, father-son kind of a thing, Master Ip, who is the best martial artist in the world with Yang style, by the way, which is yin. Karate is yang. Mm. It looks stronger. Male. <laughs> tai Chi is much more powerful. It's yin. And we all know females are much more powerful, so that's <laughs> a given. So, anyway, Master Rip, over time, over a couple of years, one day said that he was going to teach us this, the snake song. Well, I thought, you know, everybody, every master I've studied with for 40 years has always told me they're going to teach me something special. He did. And so it was a, a style passed on only from father to son. Why did we get it? I, I, I have some theories, but I, we, let's just say we were very lucky. And we got a style that only father to son. Because if they taught this to the public, the public would be as good as them. And then if you went into the next village, you wouldn't train with one of the Yang kids. You'd study with somebody else. So they would give enough for the students to take care of the kids on the street. They'd give enough for the um, disciples to beat all the students, but not enough to beat them. Snake style, snakes don't have arms or legs. They're very powerful. They move from their vertebrae. Think about chiropractic. Think about a thousand things. Everything is your core. Pilates is core. Uh, yoga says core. This is core. This is moving from your center. And th these are just expressions of your center. 
So you emptied your cup. I emptied I my it, cup. And refilled it, which is the other which thing. Is Master the other, Ip. Uh, it's another, it's yeah. A, he yeah. said, empty it's your beautiful. cup. And I said, yeah, I've done that before. But I did. 15 years, I just let go of everything I had to forget. And it's been another 18 years since then, you know. So it's been yeah. wow. 18, yeah, 13. So it's been phenomenal. It's just, yep. and it's following your bliss. It's following your passions. It's what you did. Um, it's what many of you have done. You just... You cross the Rubicon, you say, I don't care. I just, this is cool. I'm going to do it. Mm. And you feel stronger than ever, it seems. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm racing sailboats, and I'm doing this, and I'm 68 years old. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess it works. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ernie. Now we get to uh, Ray Harrell is our third wonderful guest. And you just turn that so that's, and I think you can pull it down pretty easily as well. This is her beautiful art yeah. behind us. Uh, Ray is, um, she is an artist of actually many media, in, including uh, very well known for her hooked rugs and, and, and does them as a fine artist. They're quite remarkable. Also does sculpture. Uh, and she has shown at the Shelburne Museum, among other museums and galleries. She also ran a gallery in Heinsberg for about 15 years that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and unfortunately for Heinsberg and all the rest of us, it's, it's um, <laughs> not, um, she's not doing that anymore. Uh, but let's, um, this is her passion and her art. So Ray, talk to us a little bit about how art has helped you lead a more enlightened, more fulfilled life. <clears throat> wow. These easy questions. I've, yeah, well, I, some... I, uh, I have to say that I've spent my whole life seeking a path, uh, not really knowing where I was going, and not knowing what would happen when I got there, and not even really sure if there was a place, and what the path even looked like, and was I on it. I had a lot of questions. And so I would uh, spend time studying with different people who seemed to know, and I respected them. I, have, I had a guru. I had many teachers. Um, I was a dancer. I've been married a few times. I have a child. I, was, I wanted to try everything. I wanted to try the world out. I wanted to know what the path was. I wanted to experience everything. And I was trying to not be judgmental about what my life looked like. So uh, consequently, I got into all sorts of pickles in the course of my life. Um, <laughs> been married a few times. I'll have to repeat that. Uh, <laughs> And, but I found out that the one thing I think that I really enjoy more than anything else is spending time inside myself, that I found that the path for me was not looking out there, it was looking in. So I started painting when I was young, but because so many other things got in the way, I sort of pushed it aside. But now that I've been married in a, in a stable situation for a long time, I was given the opportunity to have a studio and to explore painting to see if I had a talent there or not. I didn't, well, it didn't matter. Although I had an idea what I thought my painting should look like, I was uh, very judgmental about it. And I felt like my art probably wasn't very good. I don't know how many of you paint. Yeah. I think we're our own toughest critic. And being judgmental, I think, is the biggest block in our lives, whether we're judging what somebody else is doing, but for me, it was judging what I was doing, always judging myself. And I felt my art wasn't very good. I was sort of shy about putting it out there because I wasn't really sure if it was good or not. And so the more time that I spent working from the inside out and the less I judged what I produced, the happier I became. And the more I started letting go of so many things started falling away. Um, caring how I look, you know, I had long eyelashes and lots of makeup and tiny high heels and was thin, you know, it was all of that great stuff. And, but, you know, there, a time comes when you have to say, those things, they are important, I suppose, at one point in your life, but we have to decide what's really important for our whole life. And I felt like it was letting go of everything that caused me to judge anything, whether it was within myself or somewhere else. So that was how the mandalas came into being. Yeah, so these are principally mandalas. So tell us a little bit about what is your experience while you're working on these? 
I listen to music or I listen to a book on tape. I try to take that part of myself that is judgmental and distract it a little bit <laughs> so that the part of me that's truly creative can come forward and can do the work. Uh, <clears throat> I've gotten better at just being quiet in doing the work, but I, I find it's easier to, to let my judgmental mind be entertained as I work. So it's over here being entertained and my, my center is working and it produces things and I never know what it's going to be. So there's no plan. I have really no plan. Ahead. I go into free fall. <laughs> I, I don't, I really and truly will, I'll, I'll see a blank canvas and I think to myself, well, what should this be? Sometimes I start with one dot on there somewhere and I just, you know, I'll physically say to myself, okay, you know, let's see where this dot goes. Let's just not judge it. Maybe that dot is all there is. I mean, I haven't done that yet, but you know, <laughs> actually it's not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I, you know, I end up with thousands of dots. I like dots. I must have been an aborigine somewhere. But <laughs> is are there there moment? There must be moments where the painting takes you even deeper. Oh, it does. You... It does. Uh, the day is gone. I will go into my studio, and uh, all of a sudden, I'll look up, and it'll be four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You know, the day has gone by. I've forgotten to eat. Mm. You know, I, I ignore the telephone. I just, I, you know, I just want to be in that space. That space feels so good. And I feel like that without, we're in, when I was younger, I was always seeking a way of being on the path of being enlightened, of being something. I've learned to let that go and to just be with my work and be with mm -hmm. my insides and and produce the work that I do. It's not all mandalas. There's other stuff yeah. that's pretty crazy. It sort of depends on, you know. Well, even in your, with, your, with your hooked work, that was, that's also, it, it comes. That's not necessarily pre-planned. Pre Usually I'll start with an element. Uh, hooking requires so. more of a plan than painting does because it's a very long process. Uh, so, but I will find somewhere on this canvas and have something that I'll focus on and start there and allow it to grow because to me, the most enlightened thing that I could possibly do is let go of my judgment and let something appear because there's something that's much stronger than the thinking me, the judging me, that mm. you know, if I allow that part to come forward, I will have much better work and as a result, I'm happier because I've put myself in that space. Man Mandalas, when, when we've talked, it's great because I've had wonderful experiences with all three of these people and wonderful conversations already. Your path was different um, in, in a way. It wasn't as traditional. It wasn't, you know, with there was a teacher or some, someone specific that this was really, even though mandalas have an ancient tradition, that you were the rebel, that you, you know, your teacher is really inside. Could you mm -hmm. speak a little bit to that? Um, and, and why that's important to you in your life and you're following this path. I, I feel that artists generally tend to be a little rebellious. Uh, they want, they, they're rebellious in that they want to express what they see and they, you know, if, if an artist is doing what the audience wants, then he's, he's not rebelling, he's caving in and he's doing uh, what's required of him but I'm not sure what's happening for him. I'm not sure that he's growing himself so much as a person who will sort of break those bonds and explore what's really available to them on the inside as opposed to following some sort of a form. Hmm. Um, okay, what was the question well, again? I lost no, my, well, my place. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know. Oh, the rebel. It was about the rebel. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think artists are rebels. I mean, yeah. I, I was There's like, not I was, right or wrong here. It's there just, isn't. It's different. I mean, I, you know, the fellow who did the stuffed shark, you know, that was in the Brooklyn Museum that mm. was quite, um, you know, you know, it was, it's pretty obnoxious. I saw it. I really <laughs> didn't, you know, I wouldn't have done it. I, I don't, but I had to respect that that person, that there was something in his life that, that showed him that that was the way to go. Huh. And so... My judgmental self said, oh, I would never do that. But then the higher part of myself said, well, who are you to say? You know, you're only judging through what your experience as a person has been. So let's let that go and let's appreciate what someone else's experience is and not try to judge what they're doing. Uh, so I think, they, I, think, I think saying that artists are rebels in that they are constantly looking for new ways of expression 
as opposed to, you know, just following the straight and narrow. Yeah. One last question for you, and then, and then I want a question for all of you, um, and then we'll get to your questions also, um, of course. So you work with many uh, mediums, in, including publishing this, this fun book. This is actually, um, you, you want to just mention what this is. So this is barely hooked about your well, I have colleagues. A group, really. I have a group of friends, and we're not exactly teenagers. And you know we don't have the best bodies. Our bodies are a roadmap of what our lives have looked like, our excesses, our accidents. Um, you know, I mean, when we didn't take care of ourselves, and when we did take, it's all here. And so, in conversations with my friends, we decided we, that my rug hooking friends that we would do a book that was all nudes, and that we would pose uh, partially nude for a photo of ourselves in here and drop the judgment, which we did. No. Well, you don't see so anything from hooked, the chest up. It's all hooked right. Yeah. That's really awesome. And, and, and I think the youngest person is here. I don't know, where are you? She's, yeah, this was our youngest <laughs> member right here. Uh, we actually, we have several people here who did, uh, who did uh, pieces of the book. So does the, does the medium choose itself, or does the, so the, does the topic have anything to do with whether you're going to do a sculpture, or a hooked rug, or a painting, or a book? Um, or, or is, is the medium that's chosen comes from something else? I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. Okay. So, you know, I, I I've did some work on these things. I'm finished with those things, and tomorrow I have a blank canvas or an empty table. I have a blank mind. You know, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to get up, and I'm going to see what the day holds, what path I can sort of explore, uh, what can I create. Where is that seed that's going to spark me to move into something that has a, a, a body? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to just get up every day and have an experience. The, the, the mystery that, that I think the, the three of you bring in, in a way is that there really is no one path. That there are, every individual finds something that's so deeply profound and you're all so passionate and, and good at what you do, you found that thing that resonates for you. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because you know we're all here, and we all, maybe we found it, maybe we haven't, maybe we're still looking as, as we all are. How do you recognize, how do you find that path? How do you be open enough to know what is that thing that's going to light me up? Yes. Melinda. In listening to both of you, beautiful, people speak, it made me realize that one of the scariest things about if you even get to the place of knowing what your truth is, your own personal truth, like what would, what would really make you happy? Like, and, and everybody gets a glimpse. And you either acknowledge that you got a glimpse and you take steps to having more or you block it out because you think you have to do the life that you're doing. And the courage that it takes to say no to the life that you're doing that may be working it may, be, it may be the best life that anyone around you has ever even seen. But if you know inside of your own self that your truth lies elsewhere, that your joy, that your freedom, that your soul, your soul's flying lives somewhere else, to experience the death and to hold, to, to on purpose make the choice to say goodbye to a life that was working and looked really great to everyone else in exchange for the life that your soul really wants is no joke. And take some really sensitive listening. Yes, and letting go of a lot of stuff, and agreement from the world, and looking good, and feeling safe, and being right, 
<laughs> and having security <laughs> and guarantees. Uh, there's a lot there. Anything else come up for you about how you find that, that piece that you know works for you and resonates for you? Sure. Ernie. I think you touched on it. Um, if you're open to it, you'll see it. Um, there's, a, there's something, watch this. There, there's a thousand terms for this, but you'll get it all. Um, you've heard the term sixth sense, but what's gut, what's heart, what's intuition, what's knowing? Mm -hmm. If you learn to trust that, I just so happen, we, ha we have periods in our life. When I was 40, 40 things jumped in in the course of six months that altered my life. I lost a sister, I got into hospice work, I started Tai Chi. I went to this um, Managing with Heart Institute. You know, what's that all about? What it did is it taught me that we, we think from two sides. There's part of our brain that is a reference field. It's like an encyclopedia. It's what our parents said, our religion said, what we learned in school, what we're supposed to do, what our social norms are. There's another side that when you go to make an action, there's something that feels in here. That's what you talked about. You made your decision from feeling, and it certainly sounds that's the way you do your art. And I think we, if we trust that, um, it'll always come in. The, the, what I've always said is there's an old saying, and I love this happens to be Chinese. Um, when the teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. The teacher's always there, <laughs> always. It's just whether we are ready, we want to listen, or we dare change. And so if you believe that, and I happen to believe it, then if I listen to this, and I call it knowing, because I run my business like that. It drives accountants crazy, drives lawyers crazy. Um, but I, I don't, analytical is part of my process here, but if I don't feel it, I can't do it. And so my choices in life come from here. But you've just heard exactly the same way. And I'm real estate, but it's, it works in all arenas. Ray, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Um, I also am interested in the, the, the teacher piece, because you also teach mon making personal mondans. Actually, I'm going to teach a class next week uh, for Burlington City Arts on making a personal mandala. Uh, which is, it's really fun for people to do that. I'm not trying to sell the class, but I'm just talking about, you know, I encourage people to come and my blurb said, be brave, let go, uh, to where, you know, they would come in, they would make a circle, and then they would fill that circle with how they felt in the moment. And so this mandala right here, I call that the golden moment. And I call it that because, to me, that represents each moment is a whole life. You know, each moment is an eternity. And I, in the building of this piece, I started with an old piece that I had done that I was not especially happy with, but I allowed it to show through because to me that's what a golden moment is. It's when you allow the past to be part of the present, but it doesn't limit what you do and it doesn't stop you from moving forward into the future so that you're experiencing in all of these realms simultaneously. Um, so each one of these, you know, has some sort of a little spiritual experience that I would have. The mandala, there's something, there is some, a power in mandalas. If, when you do one, it forces you to experience something. Mm -hmm. there, there are certain, I mean, they're sacred. They're in all sort of, um, you know, prehistoric work. Uh, the circle appears all the time. But it's because it's a very powerful uh, shape and forces people to be in the moment with it. Okay. So. Thank you. So this is just such a wonderful space. Thank you all for letting us go deep so quickly. But um, questions that are, that are burning from any, any of you in the audience. Thank you all for being here tonight and letting, letting this happen. Thoughts, questions? Yes. I'm curious to ask Ray about that other one over there. I've been a long time fan of her artwork, but that's new. So what was that <coughs> meant to that? Well, I did that this week. <laughs> I just got home from California. I was out there during the winter visiting my daughter and my grandchild. 
Uh, and I had a painting that I did, and I think I did that paint the first painting. That, that's a second painting that's on top of an old painting. This one is too. Mm. I, actually, I was being frugal. I'm using up some of my canvases that you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I'll see. I saw something in that painting that that was crying to be exposed, but it wasn't being exposed properly in its per present con content. Mm. So I took it down off the wall and I hosed it off because it was full of flies and cobwebs. <laughs> and I reevaluated what was the soul of what I was trying to say, like in 1998 when I did the first painting. Mm. Mm. And this is what I saw. So the, where the circles are, those were all part of the original painting. Uh, so I just took and sort of incorporated the past with the present and projected it, you know, that's what that one's about. It, this one represents last week for me. This was my last week experience. Because each one, it was a good week. It was a wonderful week. to me. It was a wonderful week. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. They're off center. Why is that? Well, I, you know, I don't feel like that I have to follow any sort of, uh, form. I, you know, to me, sometimes the mandala is right in the center and sometimes it's not. I don't know. That's the way my life feels, too. <laughs> sometimes I'm here and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> Another question or comment. Yes. I was curious about when you were playing the sound, how, you know, I understand the energy goes inside, you feel the vibration, but I wondered if you weren't a hearing person, if you can still feel the sound even if you can't hear it? I can answer that two ways. One answer is that I, I can't tell you 100% because I can hear. So, but I have seen documentaries and heard about um, people who are deaf um, having profound experiences with sacred sound and healing sound, as well as sound in general, like going to hear bands and dancing. I just saw, where was that? It was on YouTube and it was these two teenage girls who were deaf and they went out to hear bands all the time. They could hear the sound in the floor. vibration to it, even yeah. though, I, and almost painful at times because of the different pitch, at least yes. for me, the intensity of oh that, my God. I wondered if it would Some penetrate people your being. As yeah. A, yeah. Yes. Some people um, really have a problem with my smaller bowl because it's a, it's a very high pitch. And um, we always say, and thank you for doing it, for giving yourself to it anyway. Um, um, because it's one thing that we're hearing sound, but what's, what's, what's really happening, I mean, the ear is a crazy thing as well. It's like this crazy spiral thing, and your ear is your first organ to be fully formed in the womb. And our ears are, are affecting um, our reality in ways that we can't even begin to understand. Um, but if you, if, you, if you drop a pebble or yell at some water and you see the ripples on the water, that's happening in your body whether you can hear it or not. You're getting bathed in a, in a, in a vibration bath that's intense. Um, I mean, and we are all day no matter where, where we are. So if you're placing yourself and letting go into a vibration bath that you trust and that is being generated from someone who has love in their heart and the intention of soothing you um, and, and restoring you to your true self and your wholeness, um, it's very different than being at a rock concert and being bathed in that environment or being stuck in traffic and being bathed in that sound. But we're being affected all day and all night by everything. What happens Thank when you. you add your voice to 
to those beats that are happening there. To the resonant field of the bowls? You, you've got these wonderful beats going, and then you add your, it's either, in, it's either dissonance or, you know, together. Do you feel, does that go inside you? Or do we, you know, we can hear it out here. But with you actually adding your your voice to this, mm -hmm. does that what happens inside you? Oh, what's what your experience? What a beautiful question. question! Yeah, what is your experience oh. when you add your voice to the bowls? That's a delicious question. Yes, indeed. Um, so what ha what I'm doing, which is not what you're asking, but what I'm doing. <laughs> And what I learned to do, which is why I love this so much, because when you're a singer, you're judging the sound that's coming out of you. You're trying to sound a certain way. You're trying to sound a certain way so that people will like it and like you. So I had to totally, not unlike letting go of karate and not unlike waking up in the morning and being open to whatever, I had to... Um, let go completely of being a singer so that I could get out of the way enough to let the sound sing me. So I tune into the bowls and I tune into you. And then in my extrasensory perception, I um, intend to match the vibration that comes out of my body to the vibrations that I see happening in the field around me. Um, so I want my body to actually be like the flute that the light is playing. Thank you for that question again. And sometimes I cry. <clears throat> Like, I, I feel really humbled by it all the time because I feel the love that the universe has for you and um, I feel the grace of who, of the love that we all really are. And so I get, I just get really touched often and I feel really honored. Have you invited others to join you? Yes, it's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on in here? <laughs> you want to? Do you want to? I don't know if we have time. We have to ask the boss. Ask the boss. You do? Well, maybe this is a good time to close, have a short <clears throat> something for those who want to stay and experience a sharing of voices. That sound good? Um, before we get into that, I just want to thank All Souls, Shelburne Farm, Shelburne Museum, Shelburne Library for creating this opportunity to just dive a little bit deeper. I know that this is because we had three wonderful people. It was a, sort of shallow, but we went as deep as we could in, in a short period of time. And I, we went I thought down. you all were really good. We were together. We got wow. it. Yeah, you, we did it. In, indeed you were. Yeah. So um, thank you. I, I also just, um, Ray's beautiful book is here you can, you can look at. These paintings might even be for sale. Mm. Um, unfortunately, Ernie does not teach Tai Chi locally. You'll have to go to Europe when he just can focus totally on that to do that. And Melinda does also in Shelburne at Yoga Roots and maybe other places, does the most wonderful, profound healings that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So I guess we'll be gifted uh, with a little bit more from her today, but I wanna thank all of you and those of you here, and Melinda, if you don't mind, to take us into a closing. But I just wanna um, close this for people who, who might feel, but also there's a reception outside. So just a, a few minutes of doing something for us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, oh. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a quick Tai Chi question.
Is that relax your arm, or is that uh, it's like a diversionary? Oh uh, no, I was just I was just illustrating that to but show that it was relaxed, but there was power. Sometimes I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. But your attention is drawn to your hand, not and not you don't pay attention to what the rest of your body is ready to do. I probably have done that. <laughs> <laughs>